Good morning, everyone. I think we'll make a start. Sure. Colleagues will, will continue to join us throughout the day. Uh, my name is Wendy Wills, for those who don't know me. So I'm director of ARC East of England, and I'm based at the University of Hertfordshire, where I'm professor of food and public health amongst other things. So really delighted to have so many of you joining and registering for this event throughout the day. It's our biggest ever annual showcase. We have more than 200 people signed up, which is amazing. Um, it means that we have had to move to the Zoom webinar platform. So the, the downside of that is we can't all see each other in the little boxes. Um, but it means it's easier to manage the event. And so hopefully you'll still get um, a good experience out of it. But do tell us when we send the feedback form at the end of the event, because that's helpful for us to plan. But one of my aims when I came in as director was sort of, uh, to increase um, participation with the ARC um, and diversity right across our region. So the fact that we have over 200 people signed up, I'm um, taking as a sign that we're moving in the right direction. 40% of you that have signed up are work at our universities across um, the east of England and a bit further afield, I believe, as well, which is great. Um, that means the other 60% represent health and care professionals, local authorities, third sector organisations, and around 15% of those who signed up are members of our communities and members of the public. So a big welcome to those and thank you for joining us. So we're here today to celebrate the work of ARC East of England, and there is a lot to celebrate and showcase. So we've done our best to sort of put it together in a format um, that might intrigue and excite people in different ways in the different sessions. So there's going to be lots of interesting presentations and the links to all of the projects that are being discussed today are in the online version of the programme. So you can follow up with anything and anyone in particular um, that sort of um, you're interested in after hearing about them today. So this morning, you're going to hear um, a set of presentations um, and each present set of presentations today is followed by a panel discussion. So lots of time for you to interact. So we're going to talk about living well in the east of England before moving on to a session where we focus on working with young people across um, East Anglia. And then this afternoon's session, um, oh, sorry, and I've forgotten the research into practice session. Uh, sorry about that. So, um, which is something we're focusing more and more on. How do we ensure that people can use our research evidence um, for the benefit of people, populations and services? And then I'll close the morning session and then you get a break, which we'll talk about a bit later this morning. And then Rasha DeMarco, our colleague at Cambridgeshire and Peterborough, uh, Foundation NHS Trust will open this afternoon and then you'll hear from some of our community members along with our public community involvement lead Rani Porter for our engaging with communities session and then you'll hear from some of our the people that have taken part in our, our fellowship program which is part of our research capacity building initiative so hopefully you'll gain lots from hearing about how they've benefited. And then hearing about some of our research, some of our big projects that have actually been a long time in the making that precede the start of the ARC even. So the sort of journey of our research, where it's come from and where it's going uh, to finish off. And then I will make some closing remarks and tell you sort of what's next. But I also wanted to mention the consultation that we've been doing um, across ARC. Um, and that sort of came about because our funding has been extended. So we've consulted with over 450 people across the region, and I want to thank each and every one of you for providing your input. We'll be circulating a summary document to give some of the headlines about changes and refinements that we're going to make during the extension period. But for those who think that their comments might not have informed what we're doing immediately, that doesn't mean they won't inform what we're doing in the longer term, because it's all been incredibly helpful. We've also showcased a lot of the work from the past year in our annual summary report. The link's on the screen there, and you can get that in the online uh, version of the programme. If any of you or your organisations would like a physical copy, just let us know and we can, we can post those out to you. But do have a read. Um, all of our themes and our projects um, are highlighted in the report and all of our different work streams, along with the impact that we're making with our report. So there's something for everyone in there. So we're recording today's session, as you can probably see on your screen. Um, and if you'd like to tweet, please do, for those who do such things. The ha it's hashtag ARC EOE Showcase. Um, perhaps we can put that into the chat as well for, for people who didn't catch that or want to check they've got it right. 
do interact with us in the chat. That will be open um, throughout the whole session. So put the questions in there and then the panels will try to pick up those questions, but also any of you online, please answer each other's questions and interact that way. So um, I think we're ahead of the game here, so which is good news. Um, and how many people have we got online? 76 so far. So people will dip in or out, which is the benefit of having this kind of online event. So firstly, we're going to hear from um, Adam Wagner from UEA, who's our theme lead for health economics and prioritization. And Adam's going to chair our first session today, Living Well in the East of England. So over to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, so as Wendy mentioned, I'm lead of the health economics and prioritization theme. Uh, we'll be hearing today in the session about living well in the East of England. We'll be having two related presentations to this. The first of these will be led by my uh, UA colleague, uh, Morag Foucault, um, who is a professor of palliative care and uh, research at UEA, and also deputy theme, <coughs> excuse me, deputy theme lead of the palliative and end of life care theme. She'll be joined by Karen Murphy. Uh, we'll be hearing about their exciting project and indeed their award-winning project on the carer nurse role, uh, which is a pilot that's just been rolled out. Um, I think that's suitable context. So, Morag, if you're happy, I will hand over to you there at that point. Okay, that's great. Uh, just try to start my video. Um, and I'm being told the host has stopped it. I don't know if my video can go on. Um, okay, I'm just going to move the slide in. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Adam. Ah, oh, sorry, just found a button to start my video. Hopefully people can see me now. Super, thank you very much indeed. So Karen and I are really pleased to present this project to you on behalf of our colleagues working on the project that you can see on the slide. So who are unpaid family carers? Well, the nice definition is lay people in a close supportive role who share the illness experience of the patient and undertake vital care work and emotion management. And these can be family, friends or neighbours, but they're often older with their own health problems. Carers are very important. They support patients with single or multiple physical or mental health conditions. And importantly, they enable them to stay in their place of choice. They reduce formal care costs considerably. Nationally, this figure is over 100 billion a year. In Norfolk and Waveney, estimates are around uh, 500 million to up to over 2 billion a year. But these are figures that are set to only increase um, as the population uh, demands for care increase. The role is complex, it's multifaceted. Um, they're often managing multiple complex symptoms, personal care, care management, practical support and emotional support, and sometimes providing overnight vigilance. It's often a changing role and the carer can be a carer to multiple people. And it's important to remember they may not be geographically close to the patient. We know that carers have health related support needs. They have health related education needs as they may need specialist knowledge and skills, but often lack training in this. And we know that their caring role negatively impacts carers physical and psychological health and even their mortality. And there are lots of reasons for this, but a primary one is that they tend to put their own health second. They prioritize the patient needs. There can sometimes be ambivalence, but also it's just that day to day reality of the caring role and their limited time. In Norfolk and Waveney ICS, carers are known to have higher than national average long-term conditions, arthritis, back and joint pain, and mental health conditions. So there are threats to carer sustainability. It's a role that's characterized by uncertainty and unpredictability. Carers are rarely acknowledged and largely unsupported by clinicians, and this threatens carer health and patient support, leading to patient and carer crises. It's important to remember that by supporting the carer, we're actually supporting two people, both the carer and the patient. There's a health policy rhetoric around carer support. Policy says that carers should be supported, but provides little guidance on how this should be done. So our solution to this was to develop a carer support nurse role, which would target nursing skills within existing structures, but across systems. And there are two evidence-based prerequisites for this role. First, that it's dedicated to carers, and second, that it's a nursing role. 
So it's dedicated to carers due to carers' known reluctance to bother healthcare professionals during what they see as the patient's time and nurses' challenge in supporting carers within their patient-led roles. And it's a nurse due to carers' known unmet health-related support needs, both their own mental and physical health needs, but also their needs in their caring role and the education and support that that requires. So this differentiates the carer support nurse role from other roles such as social prescribers or care coordinators. It's filling a unique gap requiring nursing skills and complementing existing services. So we worked very closely for, at UEA with uh, East Coast Community Healthcare in developing the role. And this saw healthcare and academia working together to develop the evidence-based role and delivering an evidence-based nursing practice. In developing the role, we work with over 70 stakeholders, regionally across health, social care and the voluntary sector, and national leaders in care support from NHS England, the QNI, Adult Social Care and Carers UK, but importantly with over 100 carers and patients as well, and there was universal enthusiasm for the role. When we spoke specifically to carers in the Great Yarmouth area where the role's located, they confirmed the national evidence about the need for better carer support. They told us that they often felt their needs were not met, but instead felt assumptions were made about how they were coping. They could feel abandoned or passed around by services and could feel underappreciated and overlooked. They welcomed the idea of the new role and felt it could create a space for their needs to be discussed provide opportunities to talk to a professional who understood how difficult it could be for carers to open up about their needs, and it would fill gaps in existing carer support. So there are five evidence-based principles behind the role. It's community-based, it's cross-sector working, receiving and making referrals across health, social care and the voluntary sector. It delivers person-centered care to carers with complex needs, complementing social care assessment and practice. It attends to marginalized communities because we know it can be even harder for them to access support. And it's educational, both to carers themselves, but also to other healthcare professionals, raising their awareness of carers and their needs and modeling best practice. So I'm gonna introduce you in a moment to Karen, who is the carer support nurse at EC. She's based in the Great Yarmouth and Northern Villages primary care home team, which supports a cluster of GP practices in the locality. And this is now an award-winning evidence-based role based on demands and intended outcomes, valuing the practice of nursing. It's currently funded as a band seven by Norfolk and Waveney ICB, but the pilot role funding ends uh, next month. We're evaluating the pilot um, led by UEA. It's a three-stage evaluation funded by Health Education England and supported by the ARC, but also by UEA Health and Social Care Partners and involves collaborators from London South Bank, University of Hertfordshire and Carer and Public Involvement Group. The evaluation completes this autumn and is focusing on the value and impact of the role, looking at role activity, the views of carers, patients and cross-sector partners. So I'm going to hand over to Karen, who's going to tell you about her role activity. Thank you, Morag. So since the pilot began, um, began I've um, received over 100 referrals for the role. Um, I set up triage systems and also needed to um, put together a waiting list. Um, I typically do home visits for assessments, which I follow up with phone calls or, um, or visits. Um, the role activities can include care acknowledgement and active listening, person-centred assessment and solutions using an evidence-based intervention, opening up conversations about what's important to the carer and their unmet support needs, and enabling solutions working together to address their physical, um, social and emotional concerns. I carry out health screening and coaching. I upskill carers when needed. And I, assist, um, I assess risk of carer breakdown and carry out crisis management and also deal with safeguarding concerns. Um, the role requires extensive interprofessional intersector working across health, social care, the voluntary sector and emergency services. And the role has also been described as a super connector. Thanks, Karen. So in terms of the feedback we've had so far from carers, it's been overwhelmingly positive. They particularly value this opportunity Karen mentioned about opening up conversations, sharing their experiences of being a carer and discussing difficult issues and feelings. Oops, sorry, I'm just trying to move the slide on. Oh, apologies, I'll just jump back. 
They really value the practical support that's been put in place and they welcome the opportunity to re-engage with Karen if they need to. So very briefly, I want to tell you about Susie, who was a carer to her mother for a number of years before Karen became involved in the last few days of her life. It allowed me to be her daughter again for the last three days of her life. When you're caring for somebody, liaising with healthcare professionals, dealing with her needs, you become a bit like a robot. If it hadn't been for Karen coming in when she did, I don't know what I'd have done. I was on my knees. She was very kind, very natural. There was no sort of, I'm the nurse here to tell you what you've got to do and you do it. It was, I'm here, what help do you need? When she said, right, we've got somebody coming in to sit with your mum tonight, I went, wow. I was able to get a bit of sleep, be more with my mum, sit with my mum, just not have to worry, will she be all right all night? And Susie went on to describe a series of other actions Karen took related to her physical and mental health. And at the end, she said she made a big difference to my family's situation. If you want any more proof that this scheme works, there's your proof. So we also had feedback from uh, one of the medical practices, and this was unsolicited. They said, we've been very fortunate to work with Karen so far. The difference she's making to our patients is incredible. In fact, since December last year, she's seen 45 carers via various referral routes, which is the highest number of engagements for carer support over all the practice areas. So this is very positive that we're going in the right direction to ensure unpaid carers are supported. And Karen says we've only just scratched the surface. So I mentioned this as an award winning role where we were the regional winner in the NHS Parliamentary Awards this year in the nursing and midwifery category. And we've been shortlisted for an RCN award um, in the innovations category. We're one of 75 finalists from over 900 submissions and we're getting the final outcome in November. What's next for us? Well, the evaluation completes in the autumn. Roll funding ends mid-October, as I said, and continued funding would ensure continuity of current provision prior to winter pressures, preventing that loss of opportunity to move to a sustainable role from the pilot, prevent loss of developed skills and established networks. We don't want to lose this super connector. But enhanced funding could develop a team approach, enabling geographic spread and enhanced carer support. So thank you very much for listening. Um, we're looking forward to hearing some questions in the panel session. Thank you very much, Morag and Karen. Uh, I've had a small role in the project. It's lovely to meet you in person, Karen. Uh, I've been hearing about your work and in the preparation running up to it for a long time. So great to find out more about the project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, as Morag has mentioned, and also Abby has put in the chat, please do add any comments that you would like to ask um, in due course, which we will ask in the panel session, which will follow the next talk, which is going to be delivered by God's Favour Ilori. Um, God's Favour is a PhD student in my theme um, and a PhD student at the University of East Anglia. Her work is looking at regional inequalities in health and what drives these differences. So at that point, God's favour, assuming you're good to go, we'll hand over to you and we look forward to hearing about your PhD work. Okay, thank you, Adam. So, yeah, as Adam said, my um, PhD work is all about regional inequalities in Elton in, in the UK. And yeah, I'll be discussing everything about it from my chapter one to the chapter three, yeah, today. So a little bit of background or introduction, I'd say um, regional inequalities in health can be defined as geographical variation in, in health outcomes. And it's been very, very significant over time now, and it has caused urgent challenges for policymakers. And we could see that despite great health achievement over the years, regional health disparities still persist in the UK. And this has caused both human and financial, uh, financial burden to the economy. And the Office for Health Improvement and Disparities recently said that it has cost 30 billion pounds of a year loss of productivity in the UK. And for my um, project, I'll, I'll be working, I'm working, to, as in to give it a little bit of context, I'm working with 11 regions for my chapter one. 
um, excluding um, the Northern Ireland because there is no data for that. And in for, for the chapter two, I'm, I'm working on nine um, geographical regions in England. So a little bit of context to that. So um, research questions. My thesis generally is um, looking at this broad um, research questions. For my chapter one, I am actually, my, the, the research questions is on what lies behind the differences in health outcomes across regions in the UK. And then for my chapter two, the broad research question is, does the neighborhood environment contribute to hypertension and chronic kidney disease disparities in England? And for chapter three, I'm looking at what are the underlying sources of the of chronic kidney disease disparities between coastal and non-coastal areas in the east of England region. So a little bit of um, explanation to this research question. So my chapter one, I'm looking at the UK generally, and chapter two, I'm focusing on England, but this time I'm looking at diseases burden, which is the chronic kidney disease in England. And then for the um, for my last chapter, I'm looking at the coastal and non-coastal region, but then for the east of England region only. So a little bit of method overview. So for my method, I'm using a statistical um, analysis to 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 work on my um, research questions. And in that, I would say that I'm using um, an objective health measures. These um, health measures has been collected by nurses. Um, I've been collected by nurses, so yeah. And then for the the, the name of the data is the United Kingdom um, Household Longitudinal Study. Can also be called the Understanding Society. And yeah, they are the one that, that is providing um, these biomarkers that are used for um, anal um, analysis of health. And what I actually did, I applied for a special license data, which would give me um, an access to um, the small area um, level in the UK or England. And then I linked it up with the Understanding Society data that I have. And link, I also linked it up with the English indices of deprivation of 2010. And... I also used a Oaka blinder decomposition analysis. Like I said earlier, I used um, a statistical analysis for this. What this does is actually that explains the differences in the outcome variable between two groups. So in other words, what I do is I, I try to compare um, two regions together to see the um, what actually drives this regional inequalities and look at a, a good as in a good performing region with a in a, a, a worse performing region and see what is actually driving this um, regional gap between these two regions in order to get uh, as in a, pers a perspective towards the cost. So my outcome variables that I am I, I am using I'm using a NOS um, um, a NOS measured indicator which is two and two blood based biomarker. So I'm using um, BMI systolic blood pressure, cholesterol ratio, and estimated glomerular fluctuation rate. So we all know that body mass index is actually lower or higher BMI significantly poor health. And then systolic blood pressure, I, the higher values of systolic blood pressure can cause hypertension. And for the blood-based biomarker, the cholesterol ratio, higher ratio means a higher risk of heart disease. And for the estimate, estimated glomerular filtration rate, any rate that is below 89 uh, milliliters or below 89 millimeters, yes, signifies the risk of chronic kidney disease. So these are the outcome variables that I'm using for my work. And yeah, a list of covariates that I'm also using to analyze this, um, the, the drivers of these regional inequalities. I'm using demographics, um, age and gender, um, and some other as well. And 
And for the neighborhood level characteristics, the, I'm using hair quality, the road distance to a GP, income deprivation, skill deprivation, and to mention but a few. And for socioeconomic status, I'm using household income, education, job status, and, and so. And for lifestyle factors, I'm using physical activity, smoking status, alcohol, alcohol consumption, even um, um, uh, um, daily consumption of fruit as well, as um, some of the factors of, as in some of the factors that are driving regional inequalities in these regions. So yeah. These are um, um, preliminary results so far that I've um, collected from my analysis. So what I found is that London has a better health outcome compared to the rest of the regions of the UK. So what I do now is that the fact that London has a better health outcome compared to the rest of the region. So I used London as my base category to compare all, the, all other regions to see what actually London is doing well that other regions need to follow up on. And so in order in, in doing that, I'm actually looking at those drivers that actually is causing this regional gap. And yeah, and also in the research, I found that there are evidence, there are evidence regional disparities. There are um, evidence regional differences in all health measures. So previously I made mention of the four health outcomes that I'm using. And in all of those four health outcomes, you could, as I found out in my result, that there are regional differences in health, in all of those health outcomes. And for my research questions for chapter one, so I found that job status, education, and alcohol consumption are the reoccurring factors that are contributing to regional gap in health outcomes in the UK. And for, for the research question too as well, I found that the neighborhood level factors significantly contributes to regional disparities in both hypertension and chronic kidney disease in England. So you could remember the different neighborhood level factors that I mentioned earlier. So these are actually contributing factors to regional disparities in England. And lastly, I found that, that they, are, they are coastal and um, I'm I found out that they are coastal and um sorry, I think these comments are blocking my um, slide. Yeah, they are coastal and inland disparities in chronic kidney disease in the east of England region with age and household income contributing to the highest to, to these disparities. So policy implications now so far. I would say that there are individual level characteristics, as in the individual level characteristics contributes to regional disparities in health care outcomes in England and the whole of the UK. So what this means is that um, the individual level characteristics, which are the lifetime factors, the socioeconomic status, and the demographics, they, they contribute to regional disparities in health outcomes. And also the... Um, the small area environment also plays a crucial role towards regional disparities in hypertension and chronic kidney disease in England. Previously, previous literature has only included individual level characteristics, and everyone is like saying about that individual level characteristics affects regional disparities. But now my work is saying that the, in, the neighborhood environment should not be neglected as well, just as it plays a crucial role towards regional disparities in hypertension and chronic kidney disease in England. And lastly, for the coastal and um, inland um, disparities, we found that intervention focusing on the older population and leveling the average job pay of the coastal area population with their inland neighbors would reduce chronic kidney disease disparities in the east of England region. And I would want to say thank you to the NHR Acoustics of England for funding this research and also the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences, UEA, for also funding as well and my supervisors. But yeah, I'll be looking forward to um, hearing your comments and feedback and thank you for listening. Thank you very much, God's favour. Uh, great presentation um, and great to get an overview of your project. Our 
speakers have been very efficient, so we have a fair bit of time for questions. So, uh, Arc Core, are we asking the presenters now to turn their videos on and unmute? Let me know if that's the right thing. I think that's going to be the case. So, uh, we've got questions, a few questions in the chat. I will probably lead the CSN project to start with. Um, Morag or Karen, I'm not sure who wants to take this one, but we've had one question about where have your referrals come from? Um, Karen, do you want to take that? Yeah, a, a really quite a broad range of referrals have come through to us from um, from various um, different avenues. Um, we had really good engagement from one of our local GPs, East Norfolk um, Medical Practice, um, our um, the primary care um, ho home team at Great Yarmouth, the community team, um, sent through some referrals as well. We've had referrals through from the local county council um, who have... Um, come across carers um, in, in their line of work where they've been going out maybe to do home adaptations, etc. We've also had referrals through from community mental health, um, particularly people that have been newly diagnosed with um, dementia um, and there isn't any support at the moment available for the people that care for them. Um, so they are um, pretty much abandoned um, once they've had that diagnosis, obviously, until things escalate. So this um, it's been really quite... Um, quite diverse. Um, I don't know if Morag wants to add to that. Yeah, just to say that within the evaluation, we're obviously monitoring where referrals are coming from and EC, um, have been amazing at sharing um, anonymized data from system one. Um, so we can put some sort of numbers behind the sort of the, 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 the landscape that Karen's been describing. And it looks at the moment like almost half of the referrals come within EC itself, but from across a whole range of healthcare professionals. Um, but what's quite nice to see is that there've also been some self referrals um, have come through as well. Um, and that, I think that was something Karen, you were quite keen to sort of encourage more of, um, but it's obviously about carers being aware of, of their carer label and the fact that they're in a caring role and recognising that they need support in the first place in order to get that going. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to try and fold in Michael Hornberger's question, but I will also abuse Chair's prerogative and sidle in one of my questions. How how is your time spent, Karen? We you, you've got a great deal of different types of work you could be doing. One of my interests in the project was how much time do you spend face to face um, with patients? How much of your time is spent um, like in the super connector role? What's your kind of time split between those? Sort of relatedly, also. Do you can you drop into most of the cases and resolve the problem, or are many of them ongoing that you have to build a relationship with? So, having asked two questions, <laughs> I'll hand over to you there. There's no straightforward answer either to that question. <laughs> um, it's it is subject to the carer's individual needs, so it's all about the individual's unmet needs. Um, so, my initial assessments, which take place face to face, um, can take well, I would say at least take 90 minutes um, to have those conversations and un unpick what their needs are. Um, mm -hmm. I use the Cessna in intervention. Um, uh, so um, they, I, I, before I actually meet with them, um, I send a confirmation letter in the post and um, and introduce them to, to um, the About You booklet. Um, so they can work through that and help them identify their needs as well. Um, so there has been a little bit of preparation there. Um, the depending on the how complex um, their unmet needs are, I could spend a day um, following up for an individual carer. Um, I can spend half an hour. Um, so it all depends on how you know the, the difference is there. Um, it, the and also that I mean I I try to keep it to a six week contact so try and give that six weeks or I may see somebody do a lot of referrals or a lot of in, interventions on their behalf and a lot of support on on with them um and maybe follow that up in two weeks or four weeks and then hopefully have 
got them in a better place in order to let them go really um with the option to return to me if needed if their circumstances change um within the six week period there are some people that have been a lot more complex with their needs um so they've got their own long term conditions so i may have had a carer who's awaiting an operation um that our operations then taken place they are still the primary carer for their loved one that lives with them um their loved one may then have had uh, um an event so uh, a hospital admission themselves so everything can get quite complex and the thing to remember is that the carers initial um identification of what they actually need from us um it can change um over a mm. over a period of time because we know that obviously the people that they care for aren't get, getting any better um and then um there's also potentially bereavement support as well um that i've been offering um i don't try to take on everything myself um i did notice in a comment someone mentioned admiral nurses which i'll take the opportunity to link in there um I have worked quite closely, but only recently managed to engage with the Admiral Nurses. So I do tend to signpost onto more specialist fields, um, you know, if there is something out there that can support instead of me. Grand. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, let's turn to God's Favour for a minute. God's Favour, potentially a background question that I think uh i might i think i've lost who asked the question but could you give us a bit of detail of why ckd why your particular interest on the chronic kidney disease yeah so the reason why i am particularly interested in chronic kidney disease is because at least i think it's been it's been neglected a little bit not like neglected but it's not so focused I think hypertension, diabetes, and the rest of the things are the ones that are more popular in the literature. But then chronic kidney disease has been recognized as a growing public health concerns as well. And to be honest with you, you either know someone that knows someone that has kidney disease. So, and I feel like it is something that um should be shown more light to. So that's why I am a little bit interested, or oh, I'm interested in chronic kidney disease, yeah. Thank you, Gus Favor. Uh, a question from Nikki. Um, Nikki, I'm not sure I will capture this perfectly, but um, there were, Gus Favor, in your models, are you able to address the makeup of local healthcare services? For example, might there be an issue that in a place that has um, CKD specialists, maybe the CKD patients will cluster around in that area because there's a greater specialism for treating them there? So I might have pinned that down too specifically, but the more general question of are you able to control in any way for the makeup of the local services? Unfortunately, no. It's just what the um the data, as in what I saw in the data that I used. So I think that would, should probably be one of my study limitation. Or no, I did not. A sort of a follow up question. Again, abusing chair's prerogative. One of the themes of the arc is the population and evidence and data science theme, where one of their focuses is trying to make use better use of routine data. Mm -hmm. Do you have any particular brief suggestions of how your data set could be improved or lessons that we can take from the work you've had to do with the routine data set as to improving kind of the data infrastructure what and, might have made your project easier for example and to be honest the the the, the um understanding society of all the uk the uk chillers it's like it's a nationally representative data set so it is it's done annually and and I feel um, recently they've been asking, what can you do to improve it? And I feel like most of these biomarkers, as in because they've got biomarkers data and it's for um, 2010 to 2012 that we're using, although these people still remain the same, but one thing I think can be improved if they update the biomarker data for the current year that we are doing. And I think we'll probably look at um, what's actually happening with the 
with the individuals and their biomarkers, if it's improved or it's not improved or anything like that. But aside from that, I feel like um, the data um, is working tirelessly to improve it daily. But yeah. Grand. Thank you very much, God's favor. I'm now trying to find another question for Morag and Karen. Um, so there's a question, so EK12, EK12. Um, so there's a question about sustainability, and I suppose this might think about kind of your rollout models, for example. You talked about there might be a team structure. I think Morag and I have reflected briefly as to what that team structure might look like. Might there be a senior person employing healthcare assistants, or might you have people in different um, places. So over to you. Um, how, how do you think about scalability and rollout? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's been such a positive pilot year. We've learned so much about the role. We've also learned lots about how to evaluate it, which is one of the, the, the aims of the pilot. Um, and the, the feedback, as I said before, has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, we're still sort of collecting data, but the, the, we'd be really keen to see the role continue. And obviously uh, in discussions with the ICS um, to see if that's going to be a possibility. But obviously um, funds are tight and things take priorities. I think the thing that we, we're trying to encourage the ICS to think about is the long term view and the, what happens when the carer is not su support, supported and the carer role, as opposed to Karen's role, um, is not sustained. Um, so that long term thinking is really important. And remembering that, you know, carers are just patients, too. They just happen to be in a caring role. So we need to support them. But Karen's, Karen's had some fabulous ideas about what a team should look like so I'm going to hand over to Karen to sort of describe that if that's all right Karen yeah I mean the the it's a it's a definite it needs to be led or it needs to be delivered by somebody with that um experience really time served I would say um a, a time served nurse who's who's quite well grounded and 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 has got a, a lot of life experience um because it's quite um it's quite tough. The role is actually quite tough. Um, um, and obviously I've learned this along the way. I don't think any of us really knew what to expect at the beginning, but um, but the that connection that you have with the carer is can be quite overwhelming and quite exhausting. Um uh once you've had those initial conversations and you've then and, and they've they have unburdened really and put it all over to you um so I mean I would I would personally like to see maybe somebody at band six level in in each of our community PCHs um so for example who I work with Eck have been you know, marvelous really supported me in what I've been doing um, I'm only covering a very small area so not necessarily an equivalent of me but maybe a band six level in each of the PCHs um to actually um coordinate and offer that um that support for the carers in those areas and to engage quite closely with our integrated care teams um which i think is where potentially it would fit in with that model um you know a, another branch really of um of integrated care that currently isn't really um looked at or or evaluated so um yeah um it doesn't need to be honestly it doesn't need to be a band seven role to deliver the service obviously I feel that the band seven role that I've actually gone into at the moment is simply because I've had to um, promote it manage it and deliver it um, one thing I have said to Morag in the past is when I did hit a peak and we got really got I got we got um, really quite busy is I couldn't potentially sustain that by myself um, because it was too much so it does need to it does need to be shared out a little bit, maybe managed by a um, more senior nurse. Um, we've also got um, health connectors that have been introduced to the PCHs. Um, I could see potential to be able to tap into those. But that initial evaluation of the carer's needs does need to be done by somebody in a senior nursing position, if that makes sense. Oh, has Adam frozen? 
Okay, while Adam's frozen, I'm going to take the opportunity just to come back to that question about um, the Admiral nurses. And just to say that we had lots of engagement with um, Admiral nurse leads um, when we were doing that early stakeholder work, because one of the things I was really keen on was to make sure that this was going to complement um, existing services and not be treading on anyone's toes. Um, so they were absolutely um, involved in developing the role. Um, and it's been great to see how it's played out in that, you know, that toe um, treading doesn't seem to have, have happened. Um, Adam still looks frozen to me, so I'm going to keep going because I saw some other questions in the chat, if that's right. But somebody stop me if you don't want me to do this. Um, so somebody asked a question about long term care needs and how Karen um, supports that. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give my quick answer and then I'm going to get see if Karen's got some thoughts to add. So I think the thing we needed to remember in the pilot that this was a, a, a short term period. We only had a year for Karen to work with these carers. And actually, given the time it takes to set up the role, it was actually a 10 month period where Karen's been actively um, working with the carers. Um, so that short term, a relatively short term intervention, as Karen described, of six of about six weeks has been what's been in place. But the key thing with that is about um, using that time to sort of upskill carers, um, but also and also to build their resilience in their situation. Um, I don't know if there's anything you want to add to that, Karen. Yeah, it's just been really about giving those um, those carers with their own long term health needs the the toolkit really um, in order to to um, look after themselves, um, making sure that they know who to connect and and who to connect with and appropriate pathways um, and to alleviate concerns to to educate them really as to their own benefits. So I've had carers with long-term health conditions such as diabetes and and we know that cost of living is is a real issue at the moment who can't afford a well-balanced diet so they are spending the money on the the low quality high sugar foods in order to eat um you know so th it's been really really quite diverse the supports that's been given and uh, but i've managed to connect those people to to various organizations that can help them sustain it because there is a clinical need um and i think that that has been um quite evident in the work that i've done is that if the if the individuals have the support of a healthcare professional who can actually confirm that there is a real clinical need, then more doors open for them um, and uh, and there is more support out there. And I think that that is what has been a real game changer for a lot of the, lot of the carers is to um, to have that um, somebody advocate on their behalf or somebody supporting them um, to look after themselves and to open those doors and make those introductions. And, and the, the continued support going forward has been has been marvellous, really. Thanks, Karen. Thank I'm going to hand over to Luca Mai, who I know is leading the next session, and we'll answer all the other questions in the chat. Thanks, everybody. Thank you both very much indeed. And um, yeah, just to say that, yeah, do um, put any questions that you have uh, in the chat and um, the presenters can come back to those. So thank you for that session. And um, just to um, introduce myself um, and the next session. So I'm Luca May. I'm a senior researcher at the University of Hertfordshire. Centre for Research in Public Health and Community Care, CRIPAC, where I work closely with colleagues from the ARC East of England and have led a couple of ARC affiliated projects. So my research focuses on children and young people's participation in health and care and their involvement in research. And as part of that, I lead the Hearts YPAG, which is a young people's research advisory group who work with researchers across the East of England and nationally. And we've also just co-produced a podcast on children and young people's involvement in health and care research, which may be of interest. So I'll, just to kind of plug that while I've got your attention, and I'll put some information about the group and the podcast in the chat in a minute. And just to say as well, for those of you doing research who are interested, if you'd like to do have a session with the young people's group at one of our meetings, do get in touch as well. So this second session of the day is called Working with Young People in the Region. So the first presentation is by Tim Clark, who is a research clinical psychologist at Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust. And Tim will be talking about enhancing the collaboration between local mental health systems and primary schools in Norfolk and Waverley to improve access to patient-led cognitive behavioural therapy for childhood anxiety and his research falls under the mental health over the life course theme. 
And then in the second presentation, we have Elisa Amkina, a senior study manager at Cambridge and Peterborough NHS Foundation Trust. He's going to be talking to us about the Fair Treatment Project. And this aims to link together de-identified data from different organisations to see the full picture of what's going on in young people's lives. And her study falls under the population evidence and data science theme. So as with the first session, just a little reminder that questions will be taken at the end of both presentations. So please put any questions that you have in the chat during the presentations and we'll come back to them at the end. Thank you. So Tim, over to you. Thanks, Luca May. Just checking you can hear me. Um, yep. Hopefully you can. Wonderful. Okay, so it's um, really exciting to be here. It's wonderful to be with you all and talk about some of the work that we've been doing predominantly in Norfolk and Waveney um, on a project that we've called Working on Worries, so the WOW project. And essentially it's about enhancing collaboration between uh, mental health uh, and education systems um, to support children and young people uh, with anxiety difficulties. So um, just by way of a bit of background and context, um, and many of you I'm sure will know this, but childhood anxiety uh, difficulties are, are very common and are often associated obviously with um, other negative impacts and risks such as um, those related to education, social and health outcomes. Now we know um, excitedly that there are actually lots of evidence-based um, interventions and treatments and support out there for childhood anxiety difficulties. But interestingly, uh, very rarely um, do children and people and their families actually access those evidence-based treatments. So one study by uh, Tessa Reardon suggested that those that were help-seeking for anxiety difficulties, of those that were help-seeking, only around 3% who met uh, criteria for an anxiety disorder actually ended up accessing evidence-based treatments. And we know, unfortunately, also that there is really high demand, that that demand is going up for children, young people's mental health difficulties, uh, access to services and with anxiety. Uh, and there are real capacity issues within children, young people's mental health services and provision. Uh, but we know that we need to make the most of uh, implementing evidence-based interventions for children and people's mental health difficulties and anxiety, and that novel approaches, uh, not only in terms of treatment, but novel approaches in terms of implementing evidence-based treatment are needed. So one of those potential evidence-based solutions is something called parent-led CBT. Uh, so this is actually where we use cognitive behavioural therapy uh, principles, which is an evidence-based intervention for child anxiety. Um, but we actually work directly with the child's parent or carer to support them to implement those strategies in their children's day-to-day -day life. And there's been some wonderful work that's been led uh, by uh, Professor Cathy Creswell at University of Oxford and her team in developing uh, this approach uh, and uh, testing the efficacy of this approach. The evidence suggests that actually it's effective, but also that it can be as successfully delivered by novice therapists. So that's essentially those without a core profession or a therapeutic training, um, just as well as those with a therapeutic training, and actually probably in some situations even better. We also know that because of the uh, uh, demand for uh, anxiety treatments, um, that the National Institute for Health Research, Health and Social Care Research, uh, the particular programme called the Mental Health Implementation Network, also selected uh, parent-delivered CBT for child anxiety as a target to expand its implementation. And I'll go on to tell you more about that in a moment. I also just wanted to flag that in addition to the face-to-face -face, uh, approach that I've just described, the parent-led CBT, which otherwise is known as helping your child, um, there is also a new online support intervention approach, which takes the same content, but delivers modules that last about 30 minutes and are released weekly to parents and carers. So there's now two ways of delivering this evidence-based intervention. One, which is face-to-face, -face, which is the helping your child uh, and takes um, uh, four in-person sessions of up to 60 minutes plus two telephone calls. And now this online support intervention with a dedicated delivery platform, uh, both of which are evidence-based. So um, 
probably about three years ago now, I had the privilege of being a um, uh, an ARC East of England implementation fellow. And um, we worked with a really dedicated group of pastoral workers in primary schools um, to implement uh, parent delivered CPT through the use of pastoral workers. Uh, and it was a real kind of success within our kind of small scale, small scale case study uh, with a Nebula Federation group of schools, where we really looked at the implementation outcomes and the experience of uh, parents and carers and the pastoral workers delivering this approach. Uh, and uh, most of their experiences were actually really, really positive. And um, excitedly, they were also able to, uh, uh, pastoral workers were also able to see this as a normal part of their day to day jobs uh, and something that they wished that they could sustain and that actually they have sustained. So, on the back of that uh, pilot, um, through my implementation fellowship um, with the ARC East of England, we were able to apply for the NIHR Mental Health Implementation Network funding, which I referred to earlier, where Parent delivered CBT was a targeted intervention for implementation. And that's where our next project, Working on Worries, or WOW for short, uh, was born, really. Um, and essentially, what we aimed to do was to um, expand what we'd been doing in this pilot uh, group of schools um, and train up even more pastoral workers within primary schools in Norfolk and Waveney to deliver parent led CBT for child anxiety to further implement and access uh, and increase the access of this intervention uh, to those children uh, that need it most. So we wanted to expand our approach, um, but we also wanted to uh, use implementation science principles uh, to optimize the implementation delivery and sustainability and inform future implementation of this program of work in primary schools and facilitate that shared learning. So um, we set about thinking um, uh, about implementation science uh, theories and frameworks that we could use to inform our work. Uh, and we settled on um, a, a variety of frameworks, actually, uh, one called EPIS, which is uh, Exploration, Preparation, Implementation, Sustainment. And we started to think about all the potential implementation barriers and facilitators um, that we would need um, to consider during this program. We opted for a train the trainer program. So we worked with um, children's wellbeing practitioners, educational mental health practitioners to train uh, them up in training pastoral workers in parent led CBT. Uh, we also worked with public health colleagues to identify schools where um, there was higher deprivation, higher risk factors of mental health difficulties. And then we started to work really closely with schools and senior leadership teams. Uh, to invite pastoral workers to be part of this program of work, train them up and deliver um, uh, implementation plans uh, per each school uh, to optimise um, implementation and sustainability. We also um, had the great privilege of working with a, a really dedicated group of parent and care advisors who had been part of our original pilot, actually, uh, and some other parents and carers, and they've been uh, really influential in helping uh, guide our programme and guide our implementation. So our progress to date then, that we've trained up um, 21 uh, professionals within Norfolk and Waveney um, to train others. So they've gone through the Train the Trainer programme. Um, we've um, successfully had two waves of training pastoral workers up now. So wave one, we've trained 48 uh, primary school pastoral worker staff up across 35 primary schools and they've already started to deliver the intervention. And that was only uh, in March, um, at March time. Then we've had a further wave of training of 39 additional staff from uh, a further 27 primary schools who will start delivering the intervention uh, in September, October. So, so far this equates to 13% of all Norfolk and Waverley primary schools being covered by this approach. Uh, and we hope to expand uh, even further going forwards. So uh, progress to date, um, of those that are trained, um, already 39 online support intervention cases uh, have been um, started or initiated, um, and um, nine known face-to-face -face or helping our child cases have also uh, started to date. And if we think that actually the training only was at the end of March for the first wave of training, plus with school holidays and, uh, and summer breaks, etc., um, this is really successful, successful to, to have those additional children and people and parents and carers and families 
uh, making benefit of this intervention. As I mentioned, um, it's an implementation project, so we're focusing on uh, implementation outcomes. We're using um, uh, Proctor's taxonomy of implementation outcomes to inform the way in which we evaluate and collect our implementation data. So that will look at things like uh, acceptability of the approach, adoption, um, adherence to the approach, uh, but it will also look at sustainability and the likelihood of sustainability going forwards. And we hope that as we collect that implementation data, um, we can start to develop um, and evolve our implementation strategies over time, which will lead to further implementation of this approach in even more primary schools across Norfolk and Waveney, and of course, sharing that learning across the east of England and nationally too. I'm not going to go um, through any more detail in terms of the feedback or the emerging data that we're collecting, other than to say um, the feedback for all of our training sessions, uh, both for the trainer trainers and the pastoral workers, have been really, really uh, positive and um, positively received and pastoral workers can see it as a normal part of their day-to-day -day practice. Uh, and we're also using a methodology called a lightning report to look very um, quickly and succinctly at implementation barriers and facilitators. And some of the highlights so far are things such as a time within schools for pastoral workers being a potential barrier, but a mitigating factor being the engagement of senior leadership teams. Um, some further thought around parental engagement um, uh, has uh, also been a theme. And um, school, though, um, uh, really positively are uh, seeing the implementation planning meetings where we've used implementation frameworks as uh, a really key facilitator to them incorporating this into their day-to-day -day work. And I'll just um, uh, leave with some um, good news, actually, that um, due to the uh, um, a positive outcome so far and the excitement around this project. We've been able to work really closely with our local integrated care board um, and with our um, NIHR MHIN colleagues and ARC colleagues uh, to further expand this programme. So we've had access now to further funding where we're going to continue to expand the training of parent uh, delivered CBT for child anxiety to more pastoral workers across more primary schools in Norfolk and Waveney and we've got a further training session in October and then two more planned for next year. But we're also um, going to train up all of our children's wellbeing practitioners and educational mental health practitioners in the online version of the approach. Again, which means more young people, more parents and carers and families being seen for anxiety difficulties with this um, evidence-based intervention. And just some acknowledgements that we've got a wonderful, wonderful team working with us Bryony G, Bonnie Teague and John Wilson as further leads and the wonderful Ella and Luke who uh, do a lot of the day-to-day -day running this programme and it couldn't be done without our parent care advisory group lead Rachel who's a parent carer with the lived experience herself and as part of our implementation plan we have a schools lead who's a pastoral manager in a group of primary schools um, supporting us also. Uh, thanks Luke and me. Thank you, Tim. So that's a great presentation. And yeah, there's lots of questions coming in in the uh, chat as well, which is fantastic. And we'll come to those at the end. So now handing over to um, Alicia and Anna to talk about the FAIR project. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, so let me just get this up. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. So thank you so much for having me here today. Uh, my name is Elisa. I'm here to talk about some patient and public involvement work that we've been doing on a data project called um, CADRA, and then about a new PPI, patient and public involvement community, we're setting up called Caring. Uh, Anna is the primary investigator and sends her apologies for it not being able to make it today. Uh, so uh, first, I'm going to quickly go through the cadre project. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on the design and specific outcomes, but I did want to talk about our participants' experiences and dissemination as well. And then I want to focus on caring and some of the exciting things we're doing there. Uh, so cadre study first. Um, for those of you confused, because it does say fair treatment on the um, schedule. So the full project is called Fair Treatment. CADRA is the trusted research environment. Um, uh, so this was a fairly technical and complex project. So we set out to build a trusted research environment, um, which is 
similar to a database. Um, but this would enable researcher access uh, to use de-identified records of young people from healthcare, social care, education. And the purpose of a database like this is to enable us to do things like the Timely Project, which is the development of a digital tool which, was help, which would help us um, identify when young people are struggling with mental health and then be able to get them right support at an earlier stage. Um, now, for the PPI component of this, we needed to understand what members of the public needed from us for this project to be considered acceptable and ethical. So we had three groups. Uh, we had young people aged 11 to 15, then those aged 16 to 24, and then a group of parents, carers, and guardians. Um, we ran a series of open-ended discussions with them to understand whether what we were proposing was acceptable at all, how we should handle data governance and access, um, and they also helped us create and develop information materials about the project. Uh, so what we found is that people were generally quite supportive of the potential that linked data has for research even if the data is quite sensitive. Um, they felt the early identification tools could help young people with mental health problems stop falling through the gaps in the system. Uh, but all of this came with conditions. So we had to continue building trust with the public and include them in the decision-making. We needed to stay transparent about how we're using the data, um, vet researchers for trustworthiness, and interestingly, we talked about kind of commercial organizations as well, um, but they felt that even that could be okay with the right controls, the right level of trust, which is slightly different to what kind of previous similar studies have found. And finally, we needed to be clear about what the outcomes were and what the benefits of all of these were. Um, people also brought up broader issues like discrimination, how the data could be misrepresented in the media, and when I say people, I'm talking about all of us, all of our participants. So even the 11 to 15 year olds, um, we had some quite sophisticated discussions about fairly complex and technical topics. So topics that we thought people might find boring, uh, but they engaged really, really well. Uh, so dissemination, um, dissemination back to the public was quite important to us. So that means talking about the project in plain English and in ways that looked interesting and engaging. So we fed all of our findings back to the participants in the final session and um, corrected accordingly based on what they told us because we are writing this up as a manuscript for publication. Um, but we also did things like a TikTok video for the MQ Mental Health Science Festival and uh, kind of an infographic with our findings to accompany the official report on the Dare UK website. Uh, in that final feedback session, we also asked people about what their experiences were of the workshops. We worried that it would be too technical or too dull or that people won't care about the subject matter because some people just find data boring. Um, we also specifically focused on recruiting a diverse cohort and including people from underserved groups, which also on the flip side could have caused kind of friction or disagreement between participants. Um, but actually, people were really, really positive, which was so lovely for us to hear. Um, they did have some practical suggestions for us to improve. So things like when we schedule things or the formats in which we present things. Um, but they said that felt comfortable, that everyone was kind and respectful, and that was the participants and the facilitators. Um, but we did try to keep things pretty light and informal, especially given kind of the subject matter. Oh, sorry, there's some quotes here, but I just I don't have time. <laughs> Um, uh, so here's some examples, uh, kind of visual examples of things we did. We did try to stay as visual as possible. So we used diagrams, we used a platform called Miro to keep things interactive. So things like polls, activities, post-it notes, all of this was virtual. And so you see the top two slides are kind of examples of what we've been using. And then the bottom two, so that's an example of how we were able to make a diagram of the trusted research environment much better um, with our participants. Okay, so that was our PPI work on CADRA. And next, I want to talk about a very exciting project that has evolved out of that work. Uh, we've been doing a lot of setup work um, over the past year, and we're formally launching very soon, hopefully. 
But here is a sneak peek of caring. Uh, so basically how all this happened is we had a tremendous amount of interest in the cadre workshops. So we needed about 30 participants and we had 190 signups. And also because of our recruitment strategy, we ended up with a reasonably diverse group. And these were all people who indicated on their application form that even if they couldn't take part in, in the cadre workshops, they would be interested in hearing about other opportunities for getting involved in research. Uh, so what we set out to do is to transform this initial body of work on cadre into creating a diverse, sustainable community of young people, parents and guardians who were keen to support high quality healthcare research for the benefit of children and young people. And so the purpose of caring is to facilitate that relationship between researchers and members of the public in kind of a positive, constructive way. Uh, here's a quick overview of our demographics. Um, we do collect data that's more granular than that. And we are about to start another wave of recruitment to attract more participants from some of the backgrounds which are less well represented at the moment. And here is a very non-exhaustive list of all the setup work we've done for this. Uh, so we started by interviewing some existing YPAGs, Young People's Advisory Groups, and what they found worked and what didn't. Uh, we have a report in the works, which we'll hopefully make available soon as well. Um, work has gone into really thinking through the practicalities of our structure and approach. Um, we have a questionnaire that is still live to better understand what researchers need from us. It's been really difficult to get responses. So if you're a researcher, you're interested in PPI, please go fill it out. It would be so helpful to us. Um, there should be a link in the chat at some point, but on the slides as well. Uh, we've also developed an impact assessment strategy, uh, which will allow us to understand what difference we're actually making. And we're just about to open recruitment to our advisory groups. Also, a lot of time and effort has gone into infrastructure to ensure we do everything properly with the right safeguards, uh, data protection, risk assessments, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so throughout all of this, we've been meeting every two weeks with our working group, which includes uh, public representatives as well. And they have been absolutely brilliant. They've been completely invaluable to this whole process. And we are just about to launch our website, uh, which um, will have the recruitment materials for our advisory groups uh, on there as well. Uh, so this is kind of the, the a visual representation of the structure of the community. So you can see you have all of the caring members. Then we have two advisory groups, one for young people, one for parents, which we're now in the process of setting up. And then we have a steering and a working group as well. Um, right. Uh, just want to show you some visuals. Um, a lot of our approach was born out of our cadre participants were telling us. So they wanted things to be clear and succinct. They wanted videos and diagrams and bullet points, not huge chunks of text. So that's what we're doing. Uh, and we start people from scratch. So there's no PPI experience necessary. We explain what PPI is, how they can contribute. We explain the research process itself. Um, we try to keep the language quite informal. We aim to keep things interactive, so make it a dialogue, not a lecture at them. Um, here are a few examples of kind of post-it note activities that we use in Miro. Um, and finally, so these are roughly the pathways for our participants and then for researchers um, into caring. So with our participants, we will first be doing some capacity building and co-creation, then slowly start engaging with real research projects. We'll evaluate the impacts, um, adjust on an ongoing basis. After co-creation, um, we would expect the researchers who do want to make use of caring and come work with us um, to support their PPI to follow a specific pathway within caring as well. So we can't really have people just dipping in, reading off some dry and technical slides, taking off a box somewhere and then disappearing forever. Um, we do want this experience um, to be constructive and interesting for everyone. And that's what caring is for. We're here to facilitate that. Uh, we're very excited about this project. Um, we're just doing some last minute crossing T's, dotting I's. We've got a website that's just waiting for some last minute approvals, but we do have an email address for the project. Um, if you're interested, you want to know more, get in touch. If you're a researcher who would like to work with us in future when we do kind of launch fully, um, there's an expression of interest form which you can fill out and let us know about 
what your project is, what you need from us. And there should be a link to that as well. And yeah, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, thank you so much to both of our presenters. There's quite a few questions in the chat. I think we're only probably going to have time for one or two questions for each presenter now so we can stick to time. But um, I think Alicia, Alicia and Tira, you can have a look at the questions and respond in the chat um, after. This sort of be fantastic. But just to say as well that I think I've, you know, I've, I've really liked how you highlighted how children and young people can be involved in complex topics and complex tasks. And I think there was something really important for me about how kind of the nub of public involvement is taking things that are complicated and boring and making them accessible and engaging rather than saying this is too difficult for people to understand. So Tim, a question for you. Um, is there any um, consideration of parent capacity to support your project, particularly where they might have their own physical and emotional health needs? And might children whose parents are less able to support be disadvantaged? Thanks, Luke May, and thanks, Nikki, for the question. Yeah, it's um, it's something that's come up a couple of times, and I, I guess it's important to say this is one treatment option. It's one, um, uh, it's one offer of support that parents and carers and children um, are able to access. So it's not going to suit everybody. Um, so we're really mindful, and we've had that advice from the parents and carer advisory group that this approach isn't going to suit anyone. So we've also developed signposting materials. Uh, for parents and carers that aren't able to, uh, for various reasons, um, uh, ha uh, take advantage of this support. We've also um, worked with pastoral workers um, on screening and identifying children and people and families that might um, benefit most from this particular intervention as well. Again, recognising that it doesn't suit everybody. Um, so we've been talking to them about how to have conversations with families, but also how to perhaps with the knowledge of, that they have of the children and the parents and carers, uh, select young people that might be appropriate for this approach too. Um, but yeah, we're mindful it's, it, it doesn't suit everybody's needs um, and we've been uh, supporting pastoral workers to, to identify them. Um, and I think that probably picks up on another question, Luke May, further down around... Um, any particular poor relationships between children and parents as well. Um, we also have um, the opportunity to work with um, grandparents and other support figures within the family um, uh, where there are uh, perhaps uh, is a breakdown of relationship or the parents and carers aren't able to engage uh, for any particular reason as well. Um, so we've had some examples of that happening too. Fantastic. Thank you, Tim. And uh, Lisa, another one for you about I think Adam might have put a question in about you talked about explaining public involvement to young people, but did they suggest any alternative terms or any terms that would be more meaningful to them? Not um not not something that came up spontaneously. So I know some people prefer the term participation as that kind of covers covers they feel it's more accurate. But basically, because we we will explain what PPI is and then we just don't that terminology doesn't kind of come up mm. after that because we're we're just doing it. We're doing the PPI. Um, I mean, in general, we found that with any kind of acronyms, technical things, as long as you explain it and you have kind of consistent visual reminders on slides or whatever, of pe people pick it up quickly, even like the younger kids as well. So it's yeah, yeah. But, but you are, but there is yeah, there is a potential tension there, isn't there? Like, you know, we talk about making things accessible and engaging, and then public involvement itself is. Yeah, it has plenty of jargon and terminology. Yeah, um, and nobody so agrees on that terminology either. Oh, and that too. Yeah. Um, so to sort of pick up, sort of linking the two together, I just um, so I have a question for you about. I mean, obviously, you know, you you, know, you do some fantastic work around parent engagement. You mentioned uh, involving uh, grandparents and other family members too. I just wondered what potential there is for children to engage with children as well. And also, you know, whether you're collecting data, evaluation data from children as well as parents and family members. Yeah, um, yeah this has come up a few times. So we are trying to engage uh, children and young people too. Um, as it's a parent delivered intervention and we've prioritised working with parents and carers uh, in advising this. But um, one thing that we have done is worked with those parents and carers to elicit the views of their children, particularly those that uh, took part in our pilot. Um, we're also trying to engage with local uh, participation groups where, um, because these are primary age children, there seems oh. to be less groups for um, 
younger yeah. children uh, participation group so we're trying to do that together with um, our local children's services as well um, uh, to elicit their views uh, particularly around uh, things such as uh, how they feel about pastoral workers who they may never have met before or that they yeah might not actually be delivering any kind of intervention to them individually within the schools, but they're working with their parent and carer. So that's a, a dynamic that's come up a little bit that we want to see views of children on. But any um, ideas, Luca May or uh, Alyssa as, as well, around um, engaging uh, younger children, particularly of primary age, um, uh, uh, that would be great. Yeah, absolutely. We're happy to catch up about that. And I think I mean, we're out of time now, but I think it also relates to a question that you're maybe we'll come back to in the chat from um, Lindsay Reid about what happens if the child and parent have a poor relationship. And I know from work that I've done in the past about adverse childhood experiences, you know, if, if there are other things going on in the home, how does that address all of that? So that might, that kind of links in as well. But yeah, if you could both have a look in the chat and respond to any questions that come up that you haven't had a chance to answer, that would be fantastic. But thank you both very much for fantastic presentations. And I'll hand over now to Sarah Robinson for the next session. Thank you. Thank you. And seamlessly handed over, as I'd say, what um, a great session so far. And um, it's great to see how much engagement there has been um, with the, the content and all the questions that are being asked as well. Please do continue to do that. Um, so just briefly, I'll introduce myself. I'm the implementation lead for the ARC. I've been enrolled for 18 months with the ARC team. I also work in the Eastern Academic Health Science Network, which is the innovation arm for the NHS. We're soon to be um, rebranded as Health Innovation East. So you've probably heard it here first. Um, but I'm in a really, really privileged position because both roles enabled me to work in the complexity of the health and care system to bring about positive change. And I'm really looking forward to the next two sessions. So we're going to talk about two projects in detail to think about how they've moved, their project teams have moved the research into practice to make the impact for the people that they've been working with. So please do ask questions and engage with the content in the chat and I'll hand over to Sophie Knight and to Amy Chapman to begin with. Brilliant, thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes, perfect. Brilliant, okay, thank you, Sarah. Yeah, I will just um, move on the slides. Um, so thanks so much. Thanks for thanks uh, for the invitation to be here. So my name is Sophie Knight. I'm a principal advisor um, in the delivery team at Eastern HSN or Health Innovation East, as Sarah mentioned, it seemed to be known. Um, and I've been overseeing um, a project to implement an opioid deprescribing toolkit, which came out of ARC funded research. Um, and I've been working really closely with Amy Chapman, who is an advisor, and Amy has been um, really doing all the work, the lead on the project, the day-to-day -day person, um, and making it all happen on the ground. So Amy and I are going to do a bit of a double act, just in introducing the project, what it is, where it came from, and then Amy will talk through um, in detail what the implementation steps have actually been, how we've implemented it in practice, and what that has actually looked like. So um, just before we get into the detail to say that this was a really, really collaborative project. So as I mentioned, the, the toolkit came from um, ARC funded research in the first place. Um, we then sought to implement it in North Can Waveney um, ICB. So we've worked really closely with with the ICB um, and partners across the ICS. So it's actually live across um, the ICS. Uh, now. Um, the, the PI for the project in the first instance, the, the development of the toolkit, um, was uh, Debbie Bhattacharya, who was based at UEA at the time um, and uh, in receipt of the ARC funding. Um, <clears throat> Debbie has since moved to the University of Leicester, um, but she has still very much stayed involved with the project. And so we've had a uh, University of, of Leicester involvement as well, latterly. And then also, since the project has been live, um, 
it's been part of the patient safety collaboratives core contract, which is a team within the HSN to deliver an intervention on um, supporting opioid tapering and reducing opioid prescribing. Um, so we've linked in with our patient safety collaborative team at the AHSN um, to deliver on that outcome uh, via this project. So it's been really, really um, collaborative. We've had lots of different stakeholders involved. So we like to say um, at the AHSN that we work from insight to implementation and impact. And this project alone is a really, really good example of that. So in this case, the insight came from the research uh, that informed the toolkit and the development of the toolkit. And I will go on to say a bit more about what the toolkit is and what it consists of. But there are six evidence-based um, components to the toolkit uh, about how to reduce opioid prescribing um, and opioid tapering uh, in, in the most effective way. Um, we then wanted to operationalize that toolkit and implement it. Um, so we had the idea to plan and to do that um, and to work with stakeholders to think about where that might work best, what that might look like. And then the bulk of this work, the vast majority of where we've been focused on this project has been around implementation. So we've really worked collaboratively to actually implement that toolkit um, through the production of a new pathway um, in North and Waveney. And as I said, we'll go into that in more detail. And we're now in the process of measuring um, the impact of that implementation. So we are collecting data for an evaluation and hope to um, submit that to an academic journal at the end of this year. So just to introduce a bit of background of where this project actually came from in the first place. Um, so in 2017 to 18, Public Health England reported that 5.6 million people were prescribed opioids and over half a million of these people had been continuously prescribed um, opioids for three or more years. Um, we also knew that in 2021, Great Yarm Yarmouth and Waverley CCG were the eighth highest prescribers, prescribers of opioids of all CCGs in England. And we know just from existing evidence and guidelines, if you look at the, the um, NICE guidance for chronic pain linked there in the slide, that it's they recommend against starting opioid treatment um, for people with chronic primary pain. And the Royal College of Anaesthetists um, states that um, opioid tapering should be um, undertaken, but that actually it needs careful planning and collaboration. So we knew that there's a really high level of opioid prescribing. We also know that there's evidence to say, say that that isn't always the most effective course of treatment um, for people with chronic non-cancer pain. Um, and we also know that careful thought needs to be put into actually how to reduce opioid prescribing. Um, so we, um, we there was a lot of interest from North Conwaveney because they were the highest prescribers um, of, of opioid um, in the region, I think at the time, as I've said, the eighth highest of all CCGs in England um, in 2021. Um, and they'd also already started some really great work in this area. So just there, we noted that um, they were the prescript winner for high dose opiate reduction in Great Yarmouth and Waverley for 2019, because they had made significant reductions in their levels of prescribing. Um, so they were still really high. Um, but they had they were already, there was already some really, really great work going on. There was a lot of appetite locally um, to, to, to do this, and there was already um, significant um, effort going on in this area. So we were building on um, a really great foundation of an evidence-based toolkit, lots of evidence to say that um, that this high level of opioid prescribing probably wasn't the most effective approach. And um, lots of local appetite and effort in this area already. Um, so just to say a little bit more about what the toolkit is and how it was developed. So as I say, it was developed um, by uh, Professor Debbie Bhattacharya and her team, who at the time was based um, at UEA, um, and it was funded uh, via, via ARC, by the ARC. Um, so the way in which they actually set about developing the six components in the first place was they conducted 
a literature review and looked at the evidence base for uh, what's most effective in reducing um, opioid prescribing. And 56 studies were included in that literature review. And they also conducted a national survey, um, which included identifying grey literature that might feed into this. Um, and from all of that evidence base, um, they, they synthesised the six components that came up most frequently and that were deemed essential um, to uh, effective opioid deprescribing. So to run through those six components, um, it, there needs to be a clear expectation that opioid deprescribing is the responsibility of prescribers. Um, programs need a defined pathway incorporating tapering guidelines so that practitioners know what's expected of them and what support is available. Um, there needs to be a consistent approach by all members of the healthcare team. Uh, prescribers should be equipped with cognitive behavioural intervention skills to give them the confidence to initiate and manage tapering discussions. Um, programmes should incorporate a pathway that includes access to psychological and physical support for patients. And patients need comprehensive education to align patient practitioner expectations of tapering um, and what's expected of them as well. So I'll hand over to uh, Amy now, who will talk through what we did to actually implement this toolkit in North Conwaveney in a bit more detail. Thanks, Sophie. Um, and uh, clicking for me, that's really helpful. Um, so uh, as Sophie said, really, our vision as part of the uh, implementation was to put into practice and find pathways that we could assist practitioners to be able to de-prescribe de opioids for our high dose patients. Mm -hmm. Um, we've mapped out our pathway to implementation on the right. And I think, Sophie, if you click, it's going to bring up each of those steps in detail. Thank you. Um, so initially, we it was a process of identifying our key stakeholders. So that spanned from primary care through secondary care. And also we were looking to get the involvement of patient representatives um, and also representatives from our pain clinics. Um, we completed a really thorough kind of stakeholder analysis. Um, we've uh, also mapped that across our stakeholder matrix. If you go across to step, step two, Sophie, uh, as part of this, this also took a uh, form of a uh, desktop research. We were looking at what uh, across the Norfolk and Waveney patch, what's already provided, what was working, was what wasn't working. And we also conducted a, a practitioner survey. This was again across primary, secondary patient representatives to just get an idea about what the service offer was at the moment. How could we enhance a uh, provision that was already in place, but also identify any gaps that could be there or any challenges, barriers uh, and supporting factors that we might be able to harness there. Um, if you click again, Sophie, for me. Thanks. Uh, we then hosted a three task and finish group. Well, initially there was a stakeholder event. This reviewed the toolkit. It also gave us an opportunity to identify some areas of focus from our stakeholders. This led to uh, three task and finish groups to work around uh, the implementation. So if you go to the next Thank you. I really am flying through them um, to identify the guidelines and develop the pathway. So this was uh, with uh, throughout the stakeholder event and also our task and finish groups actually defining what the guidelines and the pathway would be for deprescribing for our practitioners. Um, and we hosted a really successful launch event for this in November. So across the ICB, this was officially adopted at the launch event in November. Um, um, if you go to step five, is that going to come up? Um, as Sophie mentioned, we're going on to the process of evaluation, and this will be revisiting some of the elements that we delivered before as part of our implementation. So the practitioner survey, reviewing that and against the baseline data that we had about whether we have implemented the uh, components of the toolkit. We've reflecting on our logic model that we developed at the beginning of the program, and also we've uh, formulated a matrix, which is a real visual representation of how we've operationalized the toolkit components in practice and implemented them there. Uh, next slide, so. So just to recap the key implementation strategies, we identified our clinical leads, did stakeholder engagement. We developed and facilitated three task and finish groups, a stakeholder event, and also the successful launch event. We co-produced the new pathway and the guidelines for our practitioners around opioid deprescribing. 
Um, we've also development, uh, developed the implementation resources. So all of that pathway, everything we worked on stakeholder matrices has been made available for other areas who are looking to implement guidelines and pathways for opioid deprescribing in their area. And uh, key elements like deprescribing training for CBT um, and involvement within the incentive scheme, uh, I think used to be called the PQS for 23, 24 and 24, 25, which is being overseen by our colleagues in the Norfolk and Waveney ICB. Uh, if you next slide for me, Sophie. Um, I said before that we've got a kind of a matrix, which is a visual representation of how we've operationalized. I won't go into this because it is really, really fine detail. But along the top, we've got the toolkit components. And along the left, we have the activities we've uh, developed and facilitated or the resources that we've created with our partners. Um, and it really kind of just tries to give you an idea about what we actually did on the ground to implement some components, some evidence based components for the practitioners on the ground. Um, I think that's me, Sophie. Perfect. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll just briefly uh, talk about what we're planning for the evaluation and then what our next steps are uh, to take this forward. Um, so as we've said, um, we've implemented uh, the, the toolkit now via a series of resources and a new pathway. Um, and what we really want to look at is, is that going to have an impact on reducing opioid prescribing rates? Um, as I mentioned, there is already some really, really good work going on in Norfolk and Waveney. Um, it was going on prior to this project and it continues to go on. So attributing um, causation to this project in any kind of uh, deep, uh, reduction in prescribing rates is going to be difficult. But it's something that we're going to look at and trying to um, triangulate with other things as well. So we'll be looking at how the pathway has actually been implemented and fidelity, fidelity measures. So has it been delivered as planned? um does it does it look how we expected it to look um and is it working um as we planned for it to work um we'll be looking at staff satisfaction with it with the resources with with how the pathway is operating um with the guidance they've received etc um we'll be looking at um impact on other service delivery including um other pain medication prescriptions where that data is available um, and I think we're, there's, there's some of these things where we're still just working out the fine detail of what data we can get. Um, and then we will be looking as I said, at the impact on, on opioid prescribing rates um, and trying to look at that alongside um, trends that were already there and what's already going on in other areas. But we are aware of the issues with causation. So in terms of next steps, um, we're going to continue to promote the use of the pathway and um, it's still being embedded. It's still relatively early days. Um, so our, our colleagues um, in the ICB are doing a lot to sort of push it and promote it. Um, we're, we're carrying on with the evaluation activity now. The evaluation activity has been slightly pushed back against plan just to make sure that we've given enough time for the pathway to be properly embedded and for it to be promoted by ICB colleagues. And we are planning to submit um, a manuscript to the BMJ um, by December of this year. Um, so that's uh, where we're up to, but very happy to take questions. Thank you, Sophie and Amy. It's a really, really comprehensive presentation. Um, so it'd be great to receive some questions in the chat. There's one already for you, Sophie. Um, and we'll hand straight over to Julia. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Julia Jones, and I'm Professor of Public Involvement in Health at the University of Hertfordshire. And I'm delighted to be here this morning um, to share our research with you. First of all, I would like to acknowledge our study team who I'm representing today, um, particularly our project leads, Professor Natalie Patterson and Professor Jackie Kelly, who are unable to be with us today. Importantly, this study is a great collaboration between researchers at the University of Hertfordshire and colleagues at Hertfordshire Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust and the Adult Health Liaison Team at Hertfordshire County Council and the fantastic charity Book Beyond Words, who we've worked with for this project, 
who develop picture storybooks for people with learning or communication difficulties, including people with learning disabilities. This study was funded by the Royal College of Nursing Foundation with additional support from the ARC East of England, for which we're very grateful. So just to provide some background, first of all, to this study, um, the official name of the project is on this slide with the acronym of CARVIS. But in this presentation, I'm going to continue using the, the term people with learning disabilities rather than intellectual disabilities, because learning disabilities is a term that's preferred by um, our colleagues of learning disabilities who we've worked with on this project. So just some background, um, we know that people with learning disabilities have a higher level of physical health problems than the general population and experience barriers to receiving preventative health care, such as annual health checks and vaccinations. Also, the quite startling statistics that people with learning disabilities die approximately 23 years younger um, for men and 27 years um, for females compared to the general population. Now, this project came about um, with the spread of COVID-19 virus, and this prompted great concern that people with learning disabilities would experience some underlying vulnerability to this illness, as well as barriers to treatment, including the vaccination when it, when it um, finally arrived. The group people with learning disabilities, this group was initially not prioritised in the, um, the first vaccination rollout. And evidence soon emerged that the risk of um, hospitalisation and death from COVID-19 was proportionally higher for people with learning disabilities and particularly for people with Down syndrome. As the pandemic unfolded, evidence demonstrated that those that people with learning disabilities were five times more likely to be admitted to hospital and eight times more likely to die from COVID-19 infection. So with concerns about the uptake of the vaccination, that this would be lower among people with learning disabilities, in collaboration with our partners and with the funding that we applied for from the Royal College of Nursing Foundation, um, we worked with um, the charity Books Beyond Words to develop a visual resource called Having a Vaccine for Coronavirus, and you can see the picture of this here. Um, and in a very short time period, um, we developed this picture storybook that you can see on the slide to support the understanding of having the, the vaccination for people with learning disabilities. Um, the book was launched in May 2021. And it was downloadable for free from the um, Book Beyond Words website. We also um, printed paper copies of the resource for distribution across the region via um, our NHS Trust, um, HPFP and Hertfordshire County Council. We then conducted a mixed methods evaluation on the impact of this resource for people with learning disabilities. But an integral part to this research is um, throughout the research process, we work with people with learning disabilities to develop this resource and design the study. In early um, 2020, when um, we were all in lockdown and we were unable to um, meet with people in person, we carried out some online consultation with a group called the Purple All Stars. This is a group of adults with learning disabilities and autism who um, are part of the health liaison team within Hertfordshire County Council. Um, this amazing group who use performing arts to communicate public health messages and raise awareness about mental and physical health for people with learning disabilities. When we were finally able to meet, we, um, we had co-designed workshops with the Purple All Styles group. And you can see some of the pictures from our um, workshops here. Um, we also um, worked with people with um, learning disabilities as part of our project team, including a co-applicant at the different stages of the project. And also to add that Book Beyond Words um, developed their picture books um, with groups of people with learning disabilities.
So the evaluation, this was a mixed method evaluation with three work packages. I don't have a lot of time to go into detail. I can answer questions when we get to the panel. Um, but we conducted um, interviews with people with mild to moderate learning disabilities, informal and formal carers, and also healthcare professionals. We conducted a mapping exercise of the distribution of the resource, how it was downloaded, and also looked at the vaccine update data for our region. Um, and we also conducted a, a, an online survey. And all of these stages were informed um, by our colleagues with the Purple Stars. So um, our findings overall, the visual resource was considered really helpful to explain the COVID-19 vaccination for people with learning disabilities. We also found that the understanding of COVID-19, the vaccination was more of a process rather than a single event using one, one particular resource. Interestingly, um, the uptake of the vaccination um, in Hertfordshire and also in the learning disability population um, in Hertfordshire and Essex was higher than the general population. We also um, found from our evaluation that it was identified that local solutions were created, such as using the reasonable adjustment flags on the GP system for anyone um, who has felt needed additional support. Dentists were involved to offer sedation for people with um, needle phobia. Local health um, services provided quiet rooms in the vaccination clinics, both in acute trusts and also GP practices for the vaccine delivery um, for people with learning disabilities. So um, on to the impact and the learning from our work. Um, we've the, the visual resource having a vaccine for coronavirus has been revised based on the findings of our evaluation. And we're, that's actually going to be um, launched this Friday um, at the Royal College of Nursing um, in London. And I'm delighted that the Purple All Stars will be joining us for that, that launch and doing um, a performance for us, um, which we're all really looking forward to. We're in the process of publishing the findings from this work. There's um, a great blog on the Arc East of England website, including a video of the Purple All Stars. You can see their, um, their performance in action. We've shared our learning with learning disability and clinical networks, including Radiant. Um, that's hosted, it's a national um, network hosted by um, Hertfordshire Partnership Mental Health Trust. And we've continued our collaboration um, with our partners. And I think a, a great um, impact of this work is it's led to the development of really strong research partnership that has led to the funding of two follow-on projects. Um, a study funded by um, HPFT looking at the experience of long COVID among people with learning disabilities. And then a new study um, that I'm co-leading with my colleague Amanda Wellings, which is um, looking at creative learning ability partnerships, working with two MENCAP organisations, um, Lower Stoft um, in, East, in Suffolk and Barnet. And this um, new project just started two months ago, is funded by the NIHR by Programme Development Grant which is a great project. We're very excited about it. So um, thank you um, for your time. And I look forward to receiving any questions. And here's a picture of our very last workshop when we shared our findings um, with the Purple All Stars. Thank you, Julia. That was a really helpful presentation. I think the thing that struck me about both presentations was the parallels in all the techniques that you were talking about being born from the implementation science literature. So although we didn't present this information in terms of drawing on the academic kind of frameworks to which all the implementation strategies were developed from, um, the implementation strategies that you used and the team at Eastern used were entirely bringing on from what the literature shows are the best ways to implement. So for in particular, I noticed that both of you talked about that co-design and that involvement element, and that there's the emphasis on sharing the vision of the work with colleagues as well. Um, both of the projects featured, featured heavy emphasis about training and engagement of staff, um, and both 
projects also talked about the tailoring to the local context, which is being delivered to that with implementation that we believe that there's kind of no lift and shift of interventions and that kind of the richness that you have from working with local projects and local services is so useful to making sure that those changes are embedded and then sustained as well. I don't know if any of my colleagues who have just joined me have anything further to say on that. Thank you for responding to the really specific questions in the chat as well. I mean, nothing major to add other than to say that, yeah, exactly. I mean, we, when developing those implementation strategies and also when we've presented this before, we can link it back to particular sort of theories, models and, and frameworks. Um, and it's really, it's just really helpful to know that there's that body of literature and that body of evidence out there that can tell us the best way to do these things and that then we can even evaluate what we've done ourselves and see what's worked well in that local context and how that local context has perhaps had an impact on how, how well the different implementation strategies have worked. So yeah, really looking forward to get, getting a bit further on with the evaluation as well. Yeah. I think it's really helpful to kind of consider that evaluation of the implementation. So that process evaluation, to really think about the richness of the lessons learned. And sometimes things don't go so well, and it's about learning from that and talking about that and sharing that so that when we're thinking about another implementation project that we consider those, those lessons as well. Julia, have you got any other thoughts on this? Um, just to add, and I've seen there's a question that's come up in the chat, um, absolutely about um, using current literature and what we know from um, the policy context as well. I think our example, our, our project was happening in, in real time and very quick, um, very fast changes with the vaccination rollout as well. And I think what was so key for our risk work was that we were working at every step with people with the lived experience with the um, with the Purple All Stars, with our experts by experience in our partner organisations, um, to, to, to sense check with them that the work that we were doing um, made sense to them and um, matched their, what they thought was important to be doing with the research. Um, so I think that was, re was really key um, with our work. And we had to be very flexible with the changing landscape as the vaccination was coming out. And then the resource, we were trying to get that developed as quickly as we could. The vaccination came out slightly earlier than the, which was great. Um, but that was, you know, so we were working with that that changing time scale all the time um, and checking in with our colleagues, our cl the clinicians on the um on, on the ground floor as well, that we that what we were doing with the research was both making sense for people with learning disabilities, but also the clinicians who are responsible for rolling out the vaccination and really ensuring that people who wanted to have the vaccination had access to it. Do you want me to answer a couple of the questions? Okay, mm -hmm. I think it's come up about engaging with Purple All Stars. Um, I think the second yeah. question about engaging with people in the design of the evaluation is um, a really great question. Yeah, absolutely. So um, we have a, had a co-applicant um, who's one of our visiting lecturers at the University of Hertfordshire who has learning disabilities. And we discussed the project before we actually put in the application with him, first of all, to check that it, was, it made sense to him about the focus of the work. Um, and then we were able to meet with the, the Purple All Stars um, to, to discuss the, um, our plans for the evaluation, and particularly about how to how to identify and, and, and reach people with learning disabilities. A lot all the interviews were done, um, telephone interviews, um, because we a lot of the work was done during different um lockdowns. So that was something quite new for for us as well, because um you know, we're all used to um do, doing face-to-face -face interviews. So we were really guided by our um, by our, our clinical colleagues and the health liaison team who were the, um, the practitioners going out into the community um, and supporting people with learning disabilities and their families and their carers. Thank you, Julia, that was really, really clear. Um, well, I'll just take this moment to thank 
both groups for presenting so clearly on such impactful projects and then hand over back to Wendy to close the morning sessions. Thank you very much. Well, thanks to all of you. I think that was a really informative morning, very well structured, well planned and well presented. So round of applause from me um, for, for keeping us to time from the beginning. And I think events like this work really well because we do hear about so many different projects and different approaches. Um, but there's something to glean from everything. I was really pleased to hear, obviously, about the, the carer support nurse role, such an important project, and carer's health still remains a very under-researched area. Um, and also all the talk about data, and the use of data sets, and well done for God save her for talking through her quantitative analyses, but also the sort of access to data, linkage of data, data sharing, and governance and trusted research environments you know increasingly it's something we want to talk about more arc east of england has a regional data panel um, that's really coming into its own with our integrated care system partners and university partners um, and i think the project that Alyssa and anna are working on to do with the, the timely database and the public acceptability of sharing of data absolutely crucial we need to have more of those conversations Really enjoyed hearing about um, implementation science and implementation in practice. Again, something we want our uh, colleagues to do more and more of because we need to make use of the evidence that we have appropriately for the audiences we're trying to work with. And I think that last example from um, Julia Jones was a, a good example of that, of how to work with people with learning disabilities. So thank you to all of you. So we have more great projects to talk about this afternoon and the session will be opened by Rasha DeMarco from Cambridge and Peterborough Trust um, and then I'll end the session at four o'clock. So there's still lots to come. We will see you all back here at two o'clock. Thank you very much, everyone.